action game on. Got my rods and reels. It's the real deal. It's day seven aboard the Ultimate Lady on this amazing 10-day fishing excursion through the Astral Islands in Tahiti. The fishing on this adventure has been prolific in areas that most likely have never seen commercial or sport fishing effort. To say the least, it's been non-stop action and the trip wasn't over yet. I was invited down by the owner, Fred Lewis, along with some of his close friends from New Zealand, a prominent Tahitian, Daniel Sue, and a local world record freedive spear fisherman, Grave or as everybody knows him in Tahiti, G. The Astral Islands are located roughly 300 miles south of Tahiti and can be reached easily with daily flights from the mainland. I met up with our group to fly to the island of Ravave, where we boarded the Ultimate Lady for this offshore mission a week ago. The Ultimate Lady is just that. She's clearly one of the finest luxury sport fishing vessels in the world, measuring 93 feet in length sporting an ultra-custom catamaran hull with an exceptional 33-foot beam. She's extremely stable. With penthouse comfort, there's plenty of room to enjoy. With her unprecedented 5,500 nautical mile range, the Ultimate Lady can bring you to that unknown hotspot almost anywhere in the South Pacific. This episode continues offshore at an unnamed oceanic bank that Captain Tom Francis has put us on top of. He expects great fishing with lots of yellowfin and dog tooth tuna that are cruising the area. Tom also wants to get the boat on some large wahoo for G's attempt at a new free dive spearfishing world record. Then we'll take a quick scenic stop on Rurutu Island for the night and set course back to Tahiti with the plan of targeting Blue Marlin on our way home. Part two of our 10 day trip to the Astral Islands is coming up. I can't thank you all enough for tuning in and I promise this will be another epic IGFA Angler's Digest. IGFA Angler's Digest is brought to you by Mojo Apparel. It's time to get your mojo on by Cobian Footwear. Step into performance, step into quality, step into Cobian. And by the Los Cabos Tourism Board, making sure all your fishing dreams come true. Date is the 20th of June. So it's morning, we're on the Arago Bank. We're loving life. We had a long, arduous journey, but it was worth every mile we traveled. We're looking forward to some another amazing day of fishing on these offshore banks that have received little, if no, sport fishing pressure in the history of their being. We're bit, we're hooked up. We're double hooked, double hooked up, double hooked up. All right, battle stations. Well, the day begins quickly in the Arago Bank. In fact, super quick. We barely had lines in the water and we're hooked up. Double hookups, fighting like tuna as they bring them in. And they're these small little schooly yellowfin. Great indications that there's gonna be bait like that on this bank. We're looking forward to pro probably a great day of fishing as well. Can you imagine what a perfect marlin bait that would be? Yeah. Put the rods back out, wham, we're hooked up again. Another double on yellowfin. And uh, we're thinking to ourselves, you know, this is gonna be a great day. So Daryl lands a really nice wahoo, and we fill it the box. We have found the enemy, the wahoo. And we can find these things stacked up, but we're getting triple hookups, and wahoo's skying in the air all over our jigs. We'll put G in the water. Hey, 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 Ray, you're hooked up. Big wahoo right here. Put the lures back out again. We're feeling really good about ourselves at this point. Ow, double hookup again. This time, those reels are smoking. Those fox trolling rods are bent. Daniel Sue goes down and grabs one. He's got a nice stand-up harness. Ray gets on the other one, and it's dueling tunas. These things are fighting really well, and we know they're quality fish. And as they get close to the boat, it's a very, very vertical, dogged fight. And I'm kind of asking myself, are these more of those big dog tunas? You know, like we caught pelagically on the last bank. Big guy, big guy! Big guy! Big guy! Yes! Daniel Sue brings his in first. About a 90 pound big eye tuna. Nice job! Hey! Woo! -hoo! We're ecstatic. We're so jumping for joy because we know what kind of eats that means for us. But also, double hookup is Ray. He's on the 50 80 Fox, which is a heavier stick. You'd expect him to land that fish quicker, but no, that fish is really kicking his behind. Whoa! I think this, this yours is a bit smaller, no? Huh? 
I'll be pissed off if it is. <laughs> so by the time he brings that up close to the gaff, we realize this is a much larger fish than we had gotten previously just 10 minutes ago. Oh, yeah! Giant trembler, another big eye! <laughs> and it's a 110 pound big eye to raise credit. Great job on the Halco Giant Trembler. No, this is highly prized fish. We did eat one a few days later. It was candy. Well, after we're so aesthetic with these big eyes, we're thinking, let's try to get some more. That's a good fish. Wow, another big fish has hooked up. So Fred hooks up, he gets in the chair. We think, hey, this is a sizable fish. But not too long into the fight, we realize, nah, it's not fighting like a big tuna would be. Maybe this is a shark. And that's exactly what it was. We brought up a head, a skeletal remain of a tuna, and a huge 10 foot, 11 foot bronze whaler following right behind it. That thing was huge. That thing was this wide in the head. We put the spread back out. This time the big lures as well as the small. And this time all three big lures get piled on. Oh, explosions, man. These things are just chewing. And we see the size of the boils. We see the, we see the hole they left on the bite. And we're thinking these might be a little bit bigger fish, possibly the size that G's looking for for that world record. We bring them in, Daryl, Daryl, and Danny both did the honors, and they came in very, very quality wahoo. The spot, buddy. This is Tiger Town. <laughs> so it was enough to get G excited enough to get his gear, grab his spear, and head into the deep blue. Good luck, G. Good luck, buddy. All right. Just had chew us off about 10 minutes ago in the same location. I'm a little concerned for him, man. Oh my god, he's already got. Something boiling on his uh, linebacker. Hey, 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 his... get See the shark on the float? Shark's coming towards him. I think he's insane. But right away, we're seeing these sharks. We think to ourselves, hmm, OK, G, you need to be careful. At least you got a weapon if something does come in on you. You can pit its brain. But you're in the water. We need you to be real careful. We're in a 93-foot boat. We can't maneuver super quick to get back on you in case you have an issue. So we're all keeping our eyes on G. He's a very experienced guy. He's not stressed. Now, if he shoots a fish and dumps the spear, that orange float that's floating horizontal now will be floating vertical. The fish pulling down is going to bring that float up. That's when Captain Tom's going to know he's got a fish on that line. So he's in the water for about an hour. Floats are floating vertically. We know G got a shot. He hit something. And it wasn't long thereafter. He came to the surface. We're all looking at him. What do you get? What do you get? They all try to go through. Yeah, I was afraid of that. He got about a 45-pound wahoo on the spear. The sharks were on it immediately. He shot a wahoo, not a world record. But as soon as he shot it, it went down in the depths. Those, those bronze whaler sharks were just all over it. And at that point, he realized this is probably mute. If I do get a world record wahoo, it's just going to get gobbled. All in all, we were just happy to see G make it back to the boat in one piece. I tell you right now, it was a gallant effort on his part, and that man has got nerves of steel to get in the water in those conditions with that many sharks, knowing you'll be spearing fish. My hat's off to him. G, he's back in the boat alive. <laughs> we expected nothing less. We realized, hey, let's go survey another part of this bank. Maybe we'll find another pack of Wahoo that don't have that many sharks associated with them. We put the lures back out, and it didn't take long. We are covered up. Covered up by wahoos, man. Just bow, bow, bow. This is that wolf pack that we've been looking for for four days. Here's what happened. We just had a triple hookup. We lost two. We lost the pack good lures, didn't we? Damn good lures. We lost some really nice hardware right there. What they're doing is they're not cutting us off at the lure. There's so many wahoo back there. One's hooked up, and the other one is coming and eating the swivel way up the line. So you know there's multiple wahoo in that area. That was enough to get G excited to get right back in the water again. So it's like, let's give him a shot. We're out here. Let's get that guy back in the water. G jumps back in the water, but the effort was for naught. He saw a few fish, but nothing worth shooting. Nothing. We uh, hooked up again. We put the spread back out again. We're trolling along again. Wah! Another big, uh, big wahoo bite. And uh, Danny's got one, Daryl's got one on, and G, now back into his fishing clothes, he takes another rod. And wouldn't you know it, the luck that G has, he gets the largest wahoo of the day. 
Last drop of the day. So we decide before we pull out of the Arago Bank, we're gonna do a little more deep jigging because Danny is still looking for that 70 kg dog tooth. So we start deep jigging again. This time we're way down there, like 100 meters. Figuring maybe that's where that big elusive, you know, 70, 80, 90 kg dog tooth is hiding. And we all start hooking up right away. Big fish. I'm thinking, man, these are the really big dog tooth like we're looking for. Or these are sharks. Sure enough, I land one, and uh, and Daryl lands one, and they were huge yep. bronze whaler sharks. See you, buddy. So at that point, it's mute to think we're going to hook a big dog tooth and get it through that pack of sharks. So we had a long run to get back to Rumor Two Island, and it's going to be an all night run. So we wound them in, got dinner going, and got on our way. After a great day of fishing, we pulled into the island of Rurutu. And this is a beautiful, beautiful island here in the uh, Astrals, maybe 300 miles south of Tahiti. Is that, uh, is that correct, Dan? Yes, uh, Rurutu is the first of the Austral Islands mm -hmm. when you come uh, right from Tahiti. And um, this is the uh, a very welcoming uh, island. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of places to see. So uh, let's visit the, uh, the island. Let's take a nice drive. Okay. My new friends, Daryl, Ray, and G, were joining me and my guide, Daniel, on a quick tour of the island. The local driver took us up the road to Mahira, and the view was astounding. It was explained that the humpback whales migrate through here every year. What a viewpoint for some truly great photography. Just began our tour of Rurutu Island, and I already love this place. You can see the ultimate lady back there. We drove along this beautiful beach and we saw this scenic, this little scenic overlook of the ocean. And what the tour guide had told us is that there would literally be dozens of humpback whales out here in about another month or so. So the locals will come here, make a lunch, and just watch the, uh, the whales frolic out here in these waves. A spectacular place. Our second stop was just past the airport. We pulled down this country road and got out of the truck. Just a short hike around the corner and the jungle walls opened up. This place was very spiritual and you could feel it. Pretty good, huh? Amazing, actually. Even eerie. I couldn't imagine our next stop of the trip in my wildest dreams. We arrived at the holiest grounds on the island. Here lie the ancient graves of the kings of Rurutu. They had an incredible story to tell. The stones, um, what's the significance of the, of the, of the stones standing up? So the warriors are, are standing by here on the, on the stones and they, 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 they bend this way so that they look at the mountain because the enemies are coming from the mountains, yeah. not from the sea. Looking up. Wow. We had enough time to go through the farming community and then make a quick stop on our way back to the boat. We arrived at this man's house and bought my favorite coffee. The man was really excited to greet us and I was really looking forward to the rare taste of the Astral Islands. We made it back to the Ultimate Lady just in time and thanked our great driver who had one last surprise for me. Wow. Ah, yeah, you put the bait on this wire. You are the man. Thank you very much. This is the coolest memento I could ever bring back from Tahiti. So we leave Rurutu Island and we had a great tour. It's a beautiful place to be. And I'd love to be there during whale season when you can see all these humpback whales doing circles around there. We got a long run to Tahiti. It's 300 miles to the Northeast. 300 miles of open ocean, South Pacific, figure it out. That puts us, if you compare that to the Zane Gray expedition, that makes us look like real pioneers. Anyway, we know we have a long run and there's a bank we want to hit en route. So our sights are to make it all day run, put the lines out, see if we can stick anything, and make it to that bank by morning. Okay. Danny, we get a hook up? Yeah, we do. We're sitting here having a quiet little beer, crossing the ocean. Hello, we got a strike. We did get one nice wahoo. Fred reeled it in, did a good job on that. Guess who showed up? I'm sorry, I just can't get excited about Wahoo anymore. <laughs> we end up just uh, having a nice evening trip. The weather's getting better by the minute, and we're feeling really good about our chances 
on that high spot in the morning. IGFA Angler's Digest is proudly sponsored by Finn Addicts, Fox Travel Rods, Tough Line, Halco Lures, King Sailfish Mounts, and NCMC Wild Oceans. The fish to this point that has eluded us is the marlin. We still hadn't caught that marlin. We're getting better weather. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Water temp is right, weather's right. We're on an offshore bank, we got this kind of bait. I am smelling a blue marlin bite. Bring him in, bring him in, guys. That was like a big one, that's it. That marlin, marlin right there, I knew it. I freaking knew it. Ow, bite. Danny picks up the rod, he gets to the chair, he's doing a great job on it, and this show that this blue marlin put on, it was greyhounding back and forth. It was fighting like a black marlin. We knew it was sizable. We knew it was over that 500 mark. Back down on it, got some great activity right there at the wire, brought it in, put a tag in it. So we released the fish. The fish was in great condition, everybody is pumped. That was the fishiest place we've seen in six days of fishing out here, and you know what, it paid off. That was textbook. Blue marlin fishing. I mean, we thought we had a great trip going up to this point. We just now know that we just made it a phenomenal trip. We got the marlin. This trip has been made in my books. In G and Danny's books, it hasn't been made. These guys want to go deep drop fishing for a particular species of fish, a barracks, that I guess is so highly prized in Tahiti, he said he doubts that the president of Tahiti had ever eaten one. And they're usually super, super deep, and they've been overfished everywhere around the Tahitian Islands. Here we are on some offshore bank in the middle of nowhere. They figure if there's any shot they've got at that fish, it's on that bank. Once that line hits bottom, he's got that line in his hand because the sensitivity of your fingers feeling the bites is telling you a lot more than just the tip of that rod. We're running seven hooks because once you have that fish on that line and he's dancing around, those other five hooks that don't have fish on them yet those baits are just dancing around and enticing another bite. Ideally, you want to bring up this ganyan completely loaded, seven fish on it. We had a little competition going, and I'm thinking to myself, here's Fred, owner of the Ultimate Lady, doesn't do a lot of that deep dropping. I'm gonna put my bet that Fred outfishes these guys. They all put down a drop, and guess what? Fred brings up on seven hooks four of those red barracks. G, the local expert, brings up three. Danny brings up zero. Bingo, winner. He did not let me down. Look at the size of the eye. They're really interesting fish. Huge eyeballs, obviously a modification for feeding at depth, 1,500 feet, 500 meters. So the meat is extremely white, flaky, just yummy. <laughs> Three rods, four drops. We caught nine of the barracks, two of these silver looking fish, very, very similar in body morphology to the barracks and they were a uh, uh, papio, also a very highly prized fish. They're happy, we're stoked, we're running out a little bit of a light. We want to get on our way to Tahiti because we want to be able to fish first light in Tahitian waters for possibly another blue marlin. June 23rd, final day. It's the last day of an amazing journey and I've got mixed feelings. I've had the most amazing time. I'm loving life here in the South Pacific. I really don't want to leave. The only thing that I can drown my sorrows in is another billfish hookup. And guess what happened this morning? I'm clicking a few photographs, and after the sound of the click of my camera is the sound of a click of a Shimano Tiagra 130 getting smoked. Whoa. So we all run downstairs. It's battle stations, battle stations. And the Marlin 8 long left peeled off some line and came unbuttoned. We're thinking, doggone it, doggone it. Sure enough, left short. All of a sudden, it goes off. And Danny and I are thinking to ourselves, that couldn't be the same fish. There's two fish in this pattern right now. There's definitely two fish here. The fish comes unbuttoned. We're standing there in amazement that we just had two bites and couldn't stick one. 30 seconds later, pow, the right long goes off. Unbelievable, peel in line, peel in line, peel in line. I grab the thing, I go to get in the chair, and by the time we got situated, I didn't even clip in, I just wanted to get the handle turning. As soon as we got in the chair, the line had come unbuttoned. That was crazy. We just had three marlin bites. I thought it was the same fish. The, line, the marlin probably just got the bill on the hook, towed it out, as soon as the marlin came straight, just pulled the hook off the, off the bill, and we lost it. Three bites, two, possibly three marlin. What a way to start the day. We've already caught our marlin for the trip. We're just ecstatic that we're finding them again. But what it did is it set us up for even more 
anticipation as we got closer to the island because some of the fishiest places we were going to hit this afternoon were right off the island of Tahiti. So the feeling on the boat is that of relaxation. The trip is over for us. We've just caught marlin, we've got marlin bites, we have all these tuna, we're bringing a bunch of fresh fish back in for the folks 10 miles away at the marina. We're having lunch. Tommy go, sees the fish coming up short right. There he is, blue marlin, nice fish. Pow, eats that right uh, lure, ends up being that blue breakfast black bart again. Hooks up that fish, this is all Fred's. Nothing would make me happier than seeing the man who owns this, who the man who put us on this amazing journey, gets the last shot at the last marlin of the trip. There we go, look. That thing is one mean mother. Fred, being the angler he is, he's very calm, he's very collected. Every move he makes on that reel is calculated. And it was a good half hour fight before he brought that fish in. And the fish went down deep. It's one of those dogged bites where we're backing down on that fish is to no advantage. Beautiful 400, 450 pound blue marlin. Put on a good little show. This time, mate Justin got to wire it in. Did a great job as he always does. We brought that fish in, super bright and silver. Wasn't bronzed up, great condition unbutton it, release it, and we are in absolute <laughs> ecstatic state of mind. What a great way of putting a absolute posted stamp approval on a absolute storybook trip. It was the ultimate ending to the ultimate trip on the ultimate lady.